You are good, you are good When there's nothing good in me You are love, you are love On display for all to see You are light, you are light When the darkness closes in You are hope, you are hope You have covered all my sin Church, he's everything you need today You are peace you are peace when my fear is crippling. You are true, you are true, even in my wandering. You are joy, you are joy, you're the reason that I sing. You are life, you are life, and you death has lost its sting. Here's my response.
Again, this song is basically that creed put to music. And if you believe those words and you resonate with those words, as we sing, I want to encourage you to stand as an act of faith and an act of belief to say, yes, that's me. Let's sing together. Our Father everlasting, the all-creating one, God Almighty, through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior, I believe in God our I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again, for I believe in the name of Jesus. Yeah, amen. Forgiveness is in you. Descended into darkness, you rose in glorious life. Forever seated high. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe in you. I believe you rose again. Yes, we do. Hallelujah. Woo. 
glory. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, we've gathered to worship in this place and our hearts are full as we think about who Jesus Christ is. Thank you, Lord. We've come today to make him increase and make us decrease. Decrease, And we're so thankful, Lord, that our God is great. Our God is strong. Our God is mighty. And we come together to indeed say how great thou art, how great you are, how awesome you are. Lord, we're so thankful that we can take hope and faith in the fact that you do reign. You have always reigned and you will forever reign. And Lord, we rest our faith and our hope and our families and our church on that great truth that you reign and you will reign forever. No one will ever threaten your power. No one will ever remove you from office. But Lord, we're so thankful that you are on the throne and you'll always be on the throne. We take our faith and our hope and our trust in that here today. Oh, Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the ability that's ours to meet with you here. And Lord, thank you that you hear us. May we never take that privilege for granted. And I pray this morning as your word is opened that we'll be ready to hear what you have to say to us. And we would leave here this place, living out what we just sang and what we're about to read. Yes. We love you, Lord. Bless our time together. Thank you so much. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. 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 How many of you all believe the things that we just sang about believing? Sometimes it's so good for us just to reflect on, these are the things that I believe in. And what's amazing about that is, if you know the Apostles' Creed, it goes way back, way, way back. I think somewhere prior to like 300 A.D. It's, it's something that Christians from age old have gathered together to say, this is what we believe. And we in this room can celebrate, this is what I believe. This is what I stand in. But it's also something that goes beyond just something that we stand on to something that this is what unites us with other Christians. This is what unites us with other people and this is what helps us lock arms with other brothers and sisters in Christ. What you'll find today is that we have an opportunity to have someone preach that I'm really excited about. He's come from Montana. Not too long ago, we had an opportunity to go on a mission trip to Montana and while we were there, I got to meet uh, somebody that I'm pretty sure was my soul mate, like somebody who's just from a different mom, but like we're still brothers and sisters. Uh, he uh, earlier was joking that we were actually uh, both wrestling tag team wrestlers and we used to wear masks together. I love this man and I can't wait to hear what he has to say. My thought is this, it's, it's possible that in hearing him, in interacting with him, in connecting with him, some in this room may say, maybe God's calling me to do something radical, like sell my house and move to Montana, Amen. like perhaps leverage my resources and make sure the gospel is communicated in Montana. Whenever I have people come from somewhere else as a pastor, I get a little nervous about those kind of things, right? Because I want to keep you all right here. But at the same time, I want to see God speak his message. And if he challenges you to do something of radical obedience, then I'm right behind whatever he's calling you to do. So today, as you're listening, as you're interacting, as you're being challenged, it may be that God calls you somewhere else. That God calls you to do something awesome. It may just be that God challenges you to do something of radical obedience right here. What I want you to hear is that if God is doing it, I'm behind it as well. I believe that God does great things. So when Daryl comes in a moment, I want you to help me greet him. And I want you to greet him not simply as a friend of John's, not simply as someone who's coming to preach from Montana, but literally as another brother or sister in Christ. Somebody who has saying and declared the very things that you just said, we believe. In his case, he believed so much it moved him to Montana. In our case, we believe so much it moves us outside of our comfort zone to share with those who are around us. Whatever that may mean to you today, Let's greet my friend, Daryl Brunson.
Let's pray for God to move on him, okay? God, Daryl's here partly because he's my friend, partly because he's a North American missionary, partly because of all of those things, but the reality is, God, none of those reasons are near as big as the one true thing, and that's you've called him here. God, I pray that your spirit move on him, overwhelm him, bless him, speak clearly through him. Father, I pray that you speak to your people, open our hearts, open our minds, let us hear you and let us respond to you, Lord, that your glory may be had in his life, in this church, in the kingdom of God, because we truly do believe in you. Now, overwhelm him and let us sense your voice as he speaks. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Try it again. There we are. Good morning. Man, great time this morning so far. Uh, singing and all. Steve, thank you so much. That was awesome. I mean, if that don't uh, light your fire, your wood's wet, right? That's right. Yeah. It's good stuff. My name is Daryl Brunson. This is my beautiful wife, Veronica. We have been married for 30 years. Um, and uh, we are from South Alabama, in case you couldn't tell by the way I talk. And uh, yeah, we, we uh, moved out to Montana about five years ago, or five years ago, and we have been working to plant Expedition Church in Livingston, Montana. In Alabama, we pastored a couple of churches, served on staff at a couple of churches, uh, before moving out, God really impressed upon us a uh, sense to move out and plant our lives in a city, in an area that needed the gospel, and uh, to be a part of a church planting movement. And that's what we want to be a part of. Um, the day we launched gather our first public gathering as Expedition Church, uh, I announced that morning that we were praying for another community where we wanted to plant. And uh, we'll continue to do those things, and hopefully we'll see this year. Um, my prayer is by the end of 2021, we will see two to three gatherings started in other communities from our church. And that's our heart, and that's what we want uh, to partner with you about. And so I'm excited about that. Meeting your pastor was an absolute joy. Um, we did, uh, we kind of seemed like we shared the same brain stem in some ways. That may make you look at me differently than you were looking at me. It's okay, I'm okay with that. Um, but I really enjoyed it, meeting Michaela and the, and, and the kids this morning. We, we uh, have enjoyed it. In fact, there hasn't been anyone we've met so far that, uh, that we haven't just loved. It's been amazing. I don't know where you're keeping the crazies, but... Y'all doing a good job. We've been here for three days, and we're like, we're, we love everybody. So um, we gotta get some, we got to get some of those rooms in our church. So, all right. I want to invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to Psalm 15. John told me that you guys were in a uh, series preaching through the Psalms, and I said, that would be great. That's, I'll just jump right in on that. So Psalm 15. A great psalm. It's an interesting psalm. We believe it was written after the Ark of the Covenant had been moved to Jerusalem. As David became the new king. He tried to move it once and then finally succeeded in the second move to get it to Jerusalem. I don't know if you recall the story or not. It's found in 2 Samuel 6, and you don't have to turn there, but I would urge you to read it. But this is the basic outline or story of uh, the context for Psalm 15. The Ark of the Covenant had been captured by the Philistines. They had finally got rid of it because it was killing them. That's what the presence of God does. And so they got rid of it and it landed in a place and David, as the new king, 
took 30,000 soldiers and went to move the Ark of the Covenant. And every time you hear the Ark of the Covenant uh, in script, you read it in scripture, you hear it, you can equate that with the presence of the Lord. That was kind of the thought, and that was the, and that when, when the temple was built, the Ark of the Covenant was in the Holy of Holies. And uh, so they went to get it. And they had these two brothers that were going to, uh, they had the ark on the, uh, they picked it up, put it on the uh, ox cart, and they were going to travel, all these soldiers, and there was music going, and they were dancing, and everything was good. And then they got to a certain point on the journey, and the oxen stumbled. And one of the brothers, name was Uzzah, or Yuzah, depends on where you put the emphasis, right? And so he reached out and grabbed the ark. When he grabbed the ark to keep it from falling, God struck him dead. In fact, it says that David got angry at God. He was like, what are you doing? We're trying to do the right thing here. But there was a principle applied that David and the rest of the people of God have forgotten about. And the principle was this, God is holy and is so beyond us that we must go his way and do it in his manner rather than pick our own. They kind of picked their own way. And it cost Uzzah his life. Scared David, they put the ark there in a home and a household there and went on back to Jerusalem. And David's like, I, we'll just leave it there, I guess. Well, a little while later, maybe a few weeks, few months, whatever it was, David got to hearing about the reports of that household. And man, things were good there. They were getting blessed left and right. David said, man, we need to get that ark here. We need to get it here in Jerusalem so that the whole nation will be blessed. So they tried again. This time, though, it doesn't mention anything about an army going with him. Though I'm sure there were soldiers there, they weren't the main part. No, this time he took a, an army of priests. He did things God's way this time. And when they placed that on that ox cart this time and they began to go down the road to Jerusalem, they would stop every six steps, six steps. They would stop that cart with the ark on it and they would sacrifice an animal. And the entire way, it was a rolling uh, and stopping often, a rolling caravan of praise. They worshiped the entire way. So much so when they got into Jerusalem and they began to come down the streets of Jerusalem, it was like a parade, but it was a parade of worship. And David danced before the Lord. Y'all remember that story? Yeah, he didn't have a whole lot on. He had a linen robe on. And David danced before the Lord. I'm just undignified for anybody, much less the king. And his Baptist wife got mad at him. You know she was Baptist. What are you doing out there? And they got the Ark of the Covenant. To Jerusalem and then later some point David wrote this psalm and it asks, asks a question of us that we all must answer and it's interesting because it is a it is a question for the people of God it can be a question for anybody on the planet but the real question really gets home to the people of God because that's who David was dealing with. And David writes here in Psalm 15, I'm reading out of the English Standard, 
a psalm of David, O Lord, who shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell on your holy hill? Or to put it another way, who can get and come into your presence? Who? And he begins to list some things, uh, some laws or commandments or a moral code, if you will. The difference between a good character and a bad character. And he could have li- he could have picked a bunch of different things. He chose these verses two through five. He says, he who walks blamelessly and does what's right, speaks truth in his heart, who does not slander with his tongue, does no evil to his neighbor, nor takes up reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord, who swears to his own hurt and does not change, who does not put out his money at interest, does not take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things shall never be moved. Go back to the first question. Who may ascend to the hill? Who among us is able to enter the presence of God? Now you say, well, God's everywhere. Yeah? God's everywhere, but God also makes himself known. The manifest presence of God, you are, you are invited in or welcomed in or banished from. That was the whole point of the story with the Ark of the Covenant. There was a problem in the holiness of God and the sinfulness of man. And this psalm highlights that problem. Let's quickly walk through those verses and see just how well we do. Who may ascend? Well, verse two. Well, that's the person who walks blamelessly and does what's right. How you doing so far? Do you walk blameless? Do you always do what's right? Not looking good right now. Don't have a whole lot of people signed up to go to the holy tent. Okay, well, maybe, maybe we can go further and we can find some stuff. It speaks truth in their heart. So you always speak the truth in your heart. You never lie to yourself. <laughs> Who does not slander with his tongue, does no evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend. So no slander, no gossip. This was before Facebook. You can tell, can't you? No slander, no gossip, does no evil to the neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend. In other words, this person is trustworthy, not only with everything they do, but everything they say, and not only with people they like, but literally everyone. We got any, we got any, everybody's good? So far, no, you're still going to the hill, right? Verse four, in whose eyes a vile person is despised. Oh, good, so finally something we can do. Boy, I can despise somebody I don't like and that does evil, right? I, I, can, I can look on TV or I can look out in the, in the community and I can find people that aren't doing right and I can go up, see there, I don't like that. Hey, the next part says, but who honors those who fear the Lord. Oh, we got that one too. I can despise evil people I can honor those who fear the Lord. Surely we got that one down. Only problem is, we go to the mirror, we look in there, and we see a person 
who every time we sin, in essence, what we're really doing is dropping, neglecting, pushing our fear of the Lord away. We don't lo- when you sin, you don't fear the Lord. Uh, in fact, that's, that could be a definition of that. Sin does not equal fear of the Lord. So now I'm looking at a person who always doesn't fear the Lord, who sins, and oh, by the way, now I'm the vile person. And here's what we'll do. Do we despise our vileness or do we justify it in some way? I'm not perfect, but at least I'm not John. See how easy that is? That's what, that's what happened in the garden, isn't it? Adam pointed at Eve and said, she's the one who did it. Eve pointed at Adam and said, the serpent made me do it. Serpent didn't have no arms, so he just shrugged his shoulders. We'll either justify it or we'll own it. And when we own it, we have to realize that we're the vile person. Who swears to his own hurt and does not change. The Christian Standard Bible uh, translate that as saying, he who keeps his word, whatever the cost. Keeps his word, whatever the cost. The cost to your pocketbook, the cost to your reputation, the cost to your name. No matter the cost, you'll keep your word. Easier said than done. Who does not put out money at interest does not take a bribe against the interest. In other words, innocent. In other words, someone who does not want to make money off of the backs of the innocent or the poor. That's the kind of person that shall never be moved. That's the kind of person who can go to the tent of God. That's the kind of person who can dwell on God's holy hill. That's the kind of person who is welcomed into the presence of God. We're all there, right? Man, that's a short list, isn't it? That's a short, that that list is so short that literally there's only one name on it. Just one. And his name is Jesus. Who shall ascend to that hill? Who can go into the tent? Who can be in the presence of God? Jesus. Jesus can be there. Now, leaves us with a problem. We ain't Jesus. That's not who we are. And so when we read this, we can throw our hands up and say, well, I guess I'm out. Or we can believe the gospel. Because the gospel says that those who believe in Jesus become co-heirs, co-laborers, sons and daughters, adopted into the family of God, and yes, because of him, we are accepted in the presence of God. Not just for eternity. In other words, not just after you die, but right now. By the way, David's not asking about the when, the hereafter. He's asking, he's talking about now. Can it apply to the hereafter? Absolutely. But the application here is for life. 
Life now. And life now says this, when we have trusted in Christ, when we have accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we are accepted in, invited in to the presence of God. Man, that's incredible. We're not talking about just anybody. We're talking about the one who created all things, who knows all things, who can do all things, who will bring about all things according to his will and purposes. We're talking about the one who has all power, all knowledge, all that he wants to do, he can do. And you and I, because of Jesus, has an opportunity to talk to that one as often as we want. Man, I mean, you ought to be moonwalking on the back of the chairs. You get to sit down and talk to God. You get to sit down and shut up long enough to hear from God. Y'all know that shutting up is about the most spiritual thing you can do in the presence of God, right? Yeah. You, because of Jesus, have an open invitation. It never runs out of time. It never has an ex expiration date on it. Nothing. You can literally go as often as you want and stay as long as you want and talk about anything you want with your Creator. That's who may ascend the hill. Those who have trusted in Jesus. Jesus said in John 14, you know who I am? I'll tell you who I am. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And no one comes to the Father but through me. So who may go there? The psalmist asked a question and we can answer the question. The question asked who may go into the presence of God. The answer, Jesus and all those who believe. That's who may. If you've trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you have the invitation. If you've never trusted him as Lord and Savior, I got good news for you. All you got to do is say yes to him and you get the invitation. Hey, he, he doesn't have a limited number. No matter what some of my brothers say. He's got an open invitation. And he says, come unto me. Book of Hebrews helps us with this thought. In a passage in Hebrews where the writer is explaining through the first several chapters about Christ being the perfect sacrifice and the great high priest. So he's both and. He's not either or, he's both and. And the Old Testament and all the other priests would go and they would continually have to sacrifice. Just think about David and them as they traveled. Every six steps they would stop and sacrifice another animal. And the writer of Hebrews tells us those sacrifices did not work, could not work. Though blood was necessary, there was only one sacrifice that would work. His name is Jesus. As the sinless Lamb of God, he went to the cross and bore our sin and our shame. He was the perfect sacrifice. So much so that he would never have to do that again. There would never have to be another sacrifice because he was the perfect sacrifice. Then he's also the priest. He's the one who took the blood and sprinkles and cleanses all those who would believe. He is the priest. 
He's the great priest. He's the mediator. He's the one who has a hand on the Father and a hand on the world. And the writer of Hebrews gets to chapter 10, verse 19, and this is what he begins to say. Therefore, brothers, since we have some confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts, sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our faith without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. That's who he is. He says, let us have confidence. Let us have boldness to enter. Doesn't that sound a little weird, though? Boldness to enter into the presence of God? That's what we're told to do. Boldness to enter? Think about David when he was dancing before the Lord, and he didn't care who saw him. His dignity was not important to him. His boldness to worship God was. And he let it all go, literally. Let it all go. Boldness. Think about humility. That's the other part of it. That's the paradox. Humility. Think about David. He, went, he took humility so far that it was humiliation. I think about the, what he, the writer of Hebrews is saying. The Holy of Holies, the place where the presence of God is, that the, the Israelites understood that. He says, we have the confidence, the boldness to enter into that. Not just the high priest going once a year for all the people. No, we all have the ability and the invitation to go in. And oh, by the way, the curtain that used to hang there, it's not there anymore. Like his flesh, his flesh, it was torn to provide us access. So Jesus really is the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father, or no one comes into the presence of the Father except through him. So we can have boldness to enter. But when we enter by the blood of Jesus, that drives us what? To our knees. And so there's a humility there as well. You go back and read Psalm 15, what you'll find is that the person that thinks that they line up with all those commandments will be prideful and not humble. It's when we recognize what? That we're the vile person. And the humility sets in that we go, oh, I got to have help to get into the presence of God. And Jesus says, come on. I got you. The, the path is blood stained, but it's easy to follow. You can see my nail scarred footprints every step of the way. Come on. How often do you go into the presence of God where you acknowledge that you are in His presence? How quickly do you leave or do you linger? One of my favorite passages of scripture is Exodus 33. And in Exodus 33, they had set up the tent of meeting outside the camp and Moses would go and meet with God as a man would his friend. That's what scripture says. Every time Moses would go out to the tent of meeting, everyone in the camp would step up they would stand up and they would step to their door and they would watch Moses go and Moses would disappear into the tent and the mercy cloud would come and hover and just surround that tent and Moses would meet with God. And it says in Exodus 33 that Moses would leave, but Joshua, the son of Nun, would stay behind. Speaks to two things. First of all, Moses took a young man with him to disciple him in how to meet with God. Second thing is, 
Joshua liked it. Moses, I know you had, to, you had to have your time with the Lord, and I respected that, and that's awesome, but now that you're going back to your tent, I'm just going to hang out here with God for a little while. Is that not incredible? I mean, isn't God busy? And yet he invites all of us. I started to say rednecks. That's where I'm from, Alabama. That's what I'm used to. We got a bunch of rednecks in Montana. So what do I use here? Is it hillbilly? Okay. God invites you hillbilly. All of us hillbillies there, right? And he says, I want to spend time with you. I want to spend time with you. I want to spend time with you. My church this year, our theme is stewardship. We want to be good stewards of three things. One is our property. Another one is relationships. And the third one is prayer. We want to be a good steward of prayer. It's an, it, it, outside of salvation, the invitation to have a conversation with a creator is the greatest gift ever. It's heaven on earth. And we want to be good stewards of that. We want to spend time in his presence. We want to linger in his presence. We want to teach each other and others about how to stay in his presence. You know what happens in the presence of God? All that God is, is available. All of his knowledge, all of his power, all of his provision, all of his protection, literally everything. Nothing is off the table because of who he is. In his presence, we get to hear the steps that we need to take. It was in the presence of God over a series of time. Not in one time, but over a series that God called me to Montana. Being the spiritual giant that I am, I told him that he was going to have to tell my wife. He did. Why? Because she spent time in the presence of God. And when you spend time in the presence of God, he lets you know what you need to do. He ain't going to fill in all the details. Because you need the dependence to trust him day after day after day after day after day. He's not going to fill it all in. But I'm telling you, if you spend time with him, you'll know which way to go. You'll know what neighbor you need to visit. You'll know what ministry you need to start. You'll know what place you need to move to. You'll know what job you need to take. You'll know what school you need to attend. You'll know every single thing you need to know. All of that is available in his presence. Outside of his presence, it's just a crapshoot. It's just a guessing game. I didn't do this with the first group, but I'm, I'm going to tell you something. This is a way that you can know, <clears throat> excuse me, this is a way that you can know that you're hearing from God. When what God is asking you to do brings him glory and helps expand his kingdom, that's not the enemy. That's a God thing. When it's not that, when it doesn't bring him glory, when it's not about expanding his kingdom, you have all, in fact, I would urge you to question what you're hearing. In his presence, you get to hear. I was convicted last year that my prayer life was weak at best that I had spent time in the presence of the Lord in the past I had moments and times I used to drive a truck I was a bivocational pastor I drove a, a delivery truck we haul, I hauled uh, building materials and trusses for houses 
I think during that time that I drove that truck, my prayer life was the best it's ever been. Because it was just me and God. And though I've had times and moments where I ascended into the holy hill, I stayed in the tent, I lingered. Last year I realized that I had gotten away from that. I was doing my own thing in a lot of ways. So I was convicted of that. The only way I know to do things, I'm a linear thinker. So I, I don't, I mean, I got to see, I got to see the steps. I began to devour more scripture than I had devour, been devouring. I always read my Bible, but I began to devour it. I began to have time prolonged times of prayer. I began to use a prayer journal. And my whole goal was not to be perfect. My goal was not to be the best whatever, the best preacher, the best whatever. My goal was to spend time with God. Because with Him and in His presence, all manner of things fall into place. Listen, it may not all work out. That's not what I mean by falling in place. Y'all realize that? What I mean by falling in place is I understand it better. This last year during uh, the pandemic, and I mean, I, we're still in it, I know. By the way, look at your neighbor. Look at your neighbor. Tell them they look better in a mask. <laughs> All us ugly people love them masks, man. Right. Let our eyes do the talking. During the pandemic and during all the turmoil that we seem to have had in this country, I'm going to tell you something. I had the most peaceful time ever. In fact, I've been questioned about it. It's not me. It's him. Spending time with the Lord changes you. Don't worry about changing him. Don't worry about getting your way. Don't worry about making things work like you want them to work. Just spend time with him. And let him begin to put in your heart the steps you need to take. Y'all believe God is sovereign over all things? I do too. I don't believe it's an accident that you were born where you were born. You live where you live. You serve where you serve. You worship where you worship. I don't believe that's an accident. Y'all like the direction of the country? Y'all like living in a country that has 275 million lost people? There's only 330 million of us in it. Only China and India and Indonesia has more lost people within its borders than the United States. This is what I need you to know. A sovereign God who knows all things and can do all things chose you to live right now for a reason. He didn't make a mistake. He's got you right where he wants you. Now he may be leading you to move and he may be leading you to take other steps of faith. That's fine. But I'm telling you, you are not living in a time period that is outside of his control. He's got you here now. He didn't trust Charles Spurgeon with West Plains, First Baptist West Plains 
in 2021, he trusted John King with it. He didn't trust someone else with your neighbors. He trusted you with it. He didn't trust just anybody with the Livingston, Montana. He trusted me and my wife and a faithful group of followers of Jesus Christ with it. Spend time with the Lord. You'll find out this isn't an accident. He's got a plan. It will glorify him. It will expand his kingdom. Follow him in everything he says. Just bow your heads. Lord Jesus, as we come to you right now, we trust and know that you do have a plan. You are so, so amazing, God. That you would love us, even us, the vilest of people. But then again, you don't have anything else to work with. <laughs> Vile people is all you got. But how you take us and not only save us, but then point us to others and say, come on, you're going to be my ambassador, my messenger of reconciliation in their life. How amazing. You truly are Lord and King. Help us to recognize that. Help us to take advantage of the greatest gift, just spending time in your presence. God, on our to-do list, let's put that first. Help us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you, brother, for being here with us. I don't know how you felt about what he just said about your neighbors. And it may be that you've been the one to point out their sin. You may have been the one who noted where they've been vile. And today you realize that you are the hope that God intends to extend to them. That you're the one that he's called to reach them. I don't know if you know this, but Charles Spurgeon is a personal hero of mine. So when he said that, I was a little overwhelmed because I can't be what Charles Spurgeon was. I can't be what some of the great men of old are, but I can be John King wrapped up by God. And I'm overwhelmed that I have the right to walk up the hill of God, not because of who I am, but because of what he's done. And what I know is your neighbors need you to be their advocate. They need you to be their ambassador. They need you to be the one that shows them. And you can't do that unless you ascend the hill of the Lord. So today, if you're not saved, I'm asking you, come and get saved. Come and give your life to Christ. Come and give your hope to him. Let him change you. It may be that you are saved, but you've been trying to do it in your own power. You've been trying to do it in your own strength. You've been trying to be good enough. And today you realize I need to turn my back on that. I reject that I'm trusting what Jesus did and I'm going to follow him with everything that I am. Whatever it is he's calling you to do, now you know how to get to the hill of the Lord. I'm asking you, have the guts to run up that hill with me because our people need it. Stand. Let's respond to him today. Do what he's calling you to do. This is my desire to honor
song seems cute. It's really sweet. And we can sing it and we can mean it with like really melodic tones. But if you listen to the words, it's a radical song that requires absolute obedience. And you may be looking at what it says and thinking, I don't know. If you go to the slide right before this, go to that slide. Look what it says there. Like, Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I live for you alone. 
Right? I mean, we sing it and it sounds sweet and cute, but the reality is it is literally us surrendering our all. And we cannot do that when we're looking at ourselves. We cannot do that when we're looking at me. Because that's our everything. But when we take our eyes off of me and direct them towards him, then we realize that it's the only natural response. When we see his glory, when we see his majesty, when we see his might and his sufficiency and what he's done, then it's our natural response to say, well, then God, I give you my everything. Only because I don't have any more to give. I wish I did, <clears throat> but I'm just going to give you my everything. And he's worthy of it. So as you interact this week, as you go out into the world and you ask yourself, who may ascend the hill of the Lord? And you may think, I don't know if I can do that. The reality is you can't, but Jesus made a way for you to do that. And so by all means, to charge up that hill because your neighbors need it. They're starving for hope. They're starving for purpose. And I'm not okay with 275 million. Is that what you said? Lost? I'm not okay with that. So let's go get them. Let's go share the hope. Church, I know you all. You're some of the finest people I've ever been around. Let's leverage whatever influence God's given us to extend hope, to extend his grace. Let's do it. Today, there's some cards. I'm gonna invite you to sit down for a second. I realize I've still got a lot of talking to do. There's some cards here, and these cards represent people who are going to be involved in the Disciple Now weekend that's coming up this coming weekend. Now, I don't believe that Christians should be wimps. I think that we are people of war, spiritual warfare. I believe we need to be the grittiest of people. You'll notice these cards here say names on them. These are people who are either coming to Disciple Now or they're people who are leading in Disciple Now or they're people whose homes are going to be invaded during Disciple Now. But that's what these things are, and I'm inviting you, if you're somebody who will go up to that hill, somebody who will ascend that holy hill on behalf of the people who are on these cards, then I'm asking you to come and get not just one or two, but as many as you can commit to praying for. Because I believe that we need to go to war on behalf of the people who are gonna be helping of the kids that are going to be there, of the leaders that are going to be investing. Aiden, I can see your card right there. Your name's right there. I think you're worth fighting for, young man. Right, I think we need to look at these cards and say, it's worth it to go and fight for these kids. So if you're willing to do that today, as you're dismissed, please come and grab one. Let's go to war for these kids. Let's see God do the miraculous. Let's see him do the eternal in their lives, all right? Sure privilege to minister to you. My friend Daryl's gonna be here. You can see why I like him. He's gonna be here if you wanna come and punch him or something, just however you would treat me, do it to him, okay? And uh, um, he's got some cards also. Stand up, show him what those are, Daryl. Do you want to just lay those on the altar too so they can come and grab some of those? And uh, you'll be able to grab some of those as you're praying for our kids too. Sure has been an honor to be with you all today. I hope God's blessing as you go into this world as his ambassador. Have a fantastic day and go in his name.